Hi, this is John Maida. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of the slides I presented at the 2023 Design and Tech Report here in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest to about a thousand people in Ballroom D. The letters AI appear in all kinds of words. Sometimes they're good words, sometimes they're appropriate words, and sometimes they're awesome words. And so the report this year is about AI and how it appears in basically everything that involves designing technology products. However, it turns out that it's kind of hard to understand. So hopefully this will help you get up quickly in what it's all about. In making the report this year, I had about 180 slides and I pulled out the 30 or so that I think might be useful right now. So I am going to go over the rest of the slides that led to this sort of like a shorter version. Uh, but I want to save you time and let's get going. So this image is from How to Speak Machine. It's a redrawn chart of Ray Kurzweil's predictions that he made in 2011 that the computing power in the world would exceed that of a rodent, a human, and all the humans on Earth. Note that he predicted 2023 was the year it would be the same as humans, and I guess people feel that's kind of a creepy prediction that came true from 2011. And so when we think of ChatGPT and it came from nowhere, it's important to remember Moore's Law. This is a story I found for How to Speak Machine. It's an old British riddle. It goes like this. There's a pond with lily pads on it and the biologist clears the lily pads next to it. She lives in that house over there. What she does is she plants a certain kind of lily pad that doubles overnight. And so on night one, it's one lily pad becoming two, two becoming four, and the riddle goes, on day 30, the pond is completely covered with lily pads. And the question is, on what day is the pond half full of lily pads? Most people will say day 15. I said that, actually. It's actually day 29, because think of doubling. Overnight, those half of the pond doubled, and whoa, how'd that happen? That's the chat GPT moment in our world, because this stuff has long been coming. Now, for the design and tech reports, since 2016, I've tried to clarify that design doesn't come in just one flavor. There's classical design, design that we know from the industrial revolution, things that are considered beautiful in our house, uh, that we wear, that we experience today with our hands and our mind and our whole heart. Classical design has filled that need. Then there's design thinking, which fits into large organizations that are trying to break their execution muscle a little bit to get more divergent, more, may I say, creative. And design thinking evolved to do that. And I've been talking a long time about computational design since the 90s. And uh, I'd have people who would tell me, I don't know what that is. So I wrote How to Speak Machine. It took me six years to explain what computational design is. And I often ended up near artificial intelligence. AI being something that I've been in the space since the 1980s. Over time, it got better and better. I was noticing it. Also, the idea of conversational design is not new. Erica Hall wrote a wonderful book called Conversational Design that I highly recommend because it really lays out from a human to human perspective where it works well, where it doesn't work well. It's basically the seminal work in our times to think about how to design for conversations. And then there is my former boss, Nicholas Negroponte, who in 1967 wrote the following. Imagine a machine that can follow your design methodology and at the same time discern and assimilate your conversational idiosyncrasy. The same machine, after observing your behavior, could build a predictive model of your conversational performance. Such a machine could then reinforce the dialogue by using a predictive model to respond to you in a manner that is in rhythm with your personal behavior and conversational idiosyncrasies. Nicholas Negroponte, The Architecture Machine, 1967. That sounds a lot like what we're experiencing today. 
It's because they all experienced these kinds of technologies in the 60s and 70s, and I'll get to that shortly. Anyways, I was influenced by the work of Negroponte, William J. Mitchell, a multitude of people. And so in the 90s, I began to mix this idea of writing code, computer code, and creating graphics. This presentation is about useful AI stuff for right now. I'll have a longer presentation to do that if that interests anyone. But for now, this is what's about now. And I want to thank the folks who contributed to the survey this year. A couple things. First off, do they believe that AI is going to change the field of design? And on the average, everyone says yes, but some people think it might not. Secondly, there's been the recent spate of layoffs in tech. People are unnerved by this. Like, what does this mean for especially design people in technology? I would just say that given what I am thinking about large language model AI today, I think that you're going to be okay in the near future because there are issues that only design people will be able to address, not at the quote unquote pixel level, but how it works with the humans. We'll probably bring out the best in design, I believe. So I'm optimistic about it. And this is a list of the most prominent design and AI tools out there in my survey. I like that the mainstays like Adobe tools, also Figma with AI plugins. I love that uh, a lot of people can't spell chat GPT. It's chat GDP or chat GPT. <laughs> so anyways, um, it's chat with those three funny letters. And those three funny letters are the topic of this report. I also asked for the most obscure design AI tool out there. I have a whole list of vector DBs. I'll explain why that's important. But uh, my favorite find was the Pokemon generator. I typed in Brad Pitt and the these links are going to be available in whatever post I place this. The reason why I'm interested in starting from the model view of this new age of AI is because I met a curator in the Kyoto area who changed my life when they described how when you think of ancient Japanese temples in the Kyoto area that have stood for over a thousands of years, what's the secret to them standing for thousands of years? It's the material selection. What these carpenters do, they're called miyadaiku, go to the mountain and take trees from the south side of the mountain to use for the south side of the site. They'll go back to the mountain, take trees from the north side, from the west side and the east side. And that building stands not because of the design per se, but because of the materials they've chosen. It's made me think over the years that design is a cool discipline that is really good at selecting the right materials. You know, if you're a manager, you know the same thing. It's not the kind of technology you have within your team to collaborate. It's the team itself. It's who you've selected to be on the team. Now, when you think about so-called pre-trained foundation models, think of GPT, the most important letter is the P. So these are pre-trained models. The models we're experiencing right now, the ones in the pink, are language models. And they've gotten really good because the ketchup came out all at one time. And there are other models out there. There's vision models, there's graph models, and in the orange category, there's these unified models that cross different modalities, language and image, image and graph, graph and language. If you notice in the red there, I have a model called BB-8. That's just a joke because they have these strange acronyms. Look closely at these emerging models. Super cool stuff is probably going to happen because of it. And I'll keep a watch on it as well. And you may have noticed at the end of last year, there was a lot of buzz around generative AI, these eerie images from DALI, Imogen, Stable Diffusion, a piece by Sequoia that I thought was really fascinating when Sonia Huang posted about the Gen AI landscape on October 17. And already by October 24, I think her diagram was like double the size and it couldn't read the logos anymore. And that's just October. I like the kind of squint to be able to see the forest from the trees. And so in that report, I noticed there's this horizontal axis, the kinds of models, and there's the vertical axis, the different layers you might be in. You might be making an app or you might be working on the model itself. So basically if in the blue zone, 
you're working on the AI stuff. And the green stuff, you're working on things for consumer enterprise, things that people, enterprises can use. Then you have the fact that these different kinds of models, I mentioned uh, language models, there's code models in language as well. There's uh, vision models, graph models. They're evolving over time. Green on the right in 2030 means look to be surprised that they're really good. We're going to experience uh, across many modalities, new advances in these foundation models. And I think David Bowie said that the, in 1999 that the internet was at the same time exhilarating, but also terrifying what it would do for people. I think it gets really scary when you don't understand it. This report tries to help you quickly understand it. Think of this metaphor. It'll help guide you. It's guided me. It's called Simon Scissors. Herbert Simon was an early artificial intelligence pioneer at Carnegie Mellon and also a Nobel laureate in economics. And people in design know his name because he has this word satisficing that helps to nail the idea that design is about a lot of compromises and so satisficing is what design does really well. His metaphor is about two blades of a scissors. One blade is the blade that can think, cognition, and the other blade is context, the experience you have. When you rub the two together, it produces what looks like intelligent behavior. Think of someone who's lost their memory. They can think really well, but they're missing their memories, so they can't be who they are. So it's a combination of these two, cognition and context. Cognition being the pre-trained foundation model, and context being the memories, the thing to do right now, the prompt. Why is this hard to understand? It's because AI as we knew it is about basically like this amazing blade that you fold over to harden each cycle. You pound it, pound it, pound it with data. Uh, you train it. And this is a diagram I found in Unusual VC's post there at the bottom. But it really nails how making products with AI is hard because you got to get the data, you got to have ML people, you got to build a model, you got to wrap an endpoint around it, and then you can finally ship the product. And it's just hard to do that. It takes a lot of time and a lot of math. But with Simon Scissors and this different model, you have the large language model, which you can call from an API run locally. It's easy to use. Then you have the prompt design, which we're now getting much more comfortable with it, and also the vector DB to bring context and voila, you have your product. That's a new thing. It's a new model. It's gonna be hard for a lot of us to get used to. It's taken me a while to get used to, but I've been running as fast as I can to understand this. And so this is a way to hopefully help you too. So let's do some prompt engineering 101. That's like a basics. And first off, it's about building context. But the first thing you do is select the pink blade of the scissors, the model. And if you've heard of Ada Babbage Curie Da Vinci, notice A, B, C, D makes it so much easier. Ada came earliest and Da Vinci is the latest. And it also correlates to uh, older is cheaper and newer is more expensive. But the price is coming down if you've noticed uh, how that's been happening. And also there's all kind of language models out there, not just OpenAI's model. So. Just get excited about how much there is to know and all those acronyms. Secondly, you make the core prompt. You basically make a wish and then you give it extra context, give it examples. You can give no examples, which is called zero shot, instead of hoping it'll figure it out. You can give it one example called one shot to kind of play off of that one example. You can also give it a few examples called few shot. So the more examples you give it, the more likely it's able to fulfill your wish, kind of like another human will do. If you give them no guidance, they're going to produce whatever they think. They're going to make it up. And lastly, these models come with tuning knobs. Tuning knobs like a, basically a radio. If you don't know what a radio is anymore, it has these knobs on it. You would tune the frequency. So you tune the model by tuning knobs. Uh, this one called temperature, that's quite common. Uh, if you turn the temperature too high, the model gets more random. Uh, you turn it down, it uh, becomes more deterministic. So that's all you have to do to get your prompt ready to go. Then there's advanced prompting. It usually has to do with performance efficiency questions. 
So for instance, if you have a super long prompt you've given to the model, it costs more money than a shorter prompt. So a quick way to do that is to just use the model itself to summarize the prompt. And sometimes you can save pennies, which as you know, pennies iterate over multiple generations. You know, people, they said they'll save like a thousand people calling your service uh, a second. It's good to save a few micro pennies, right? You can also get a twofer or threefer sometimes based upon how you write your prompt. And that's also a win because again, you use less tokens. And lastly, there's something called chain of thought prompting that in improves the quality of your prompt. It's basically like if you've ever had a problem and your friend says to you, so tell me how you would do that. And you basically think out loud, lay it out, and then you go step by step. That's the same with these models. If they think out loud with you, they can come to a better conclusion. Another thing I like about these scissors is something that Sam Shalache says. Don't forget, you shouldn't run around with scissors. Also, Sam Shalache has what's called the Sunday letters. If you're into computer science, check them out. So there's a terrific paper by Stanford HAI about the opportunities and risks of foundation models. It's, I think, over 100 pages. I actually read this paper. It's super worthwhile. You see where foundation models have evolved out of the deep learning, out of the machine learning. And really, functionality is now possible instead of just thinking about how the, how the neural processing works to what it can do. That's why we're experiencing this AI ketchup bottle moment. It's like, wow, all of a sudden it's useful? The other question to ask is in how it's made, it comes from data from us that we have constructed. And on the right hand side, it gets deployed to us. And we have to ask questions about what if it does something wrong? We have to ask uh, not just business questions, but also ethical questions as well. And there's also security questions. When you put your eggs all in one basket, it makes you more vulnerable. Great questions in that paper. I highly recommend you spend the time to skim it first because it's long, but it's super useful. So I had this instructor in the 80s, Professor Joseph Weizenbaum. I had no idea that he was the goat of AI and chat. The story goes that he made Eliza, a Rogerian psychotherapist simulation in the 60s. When he made it, he left for the day and the next day his grad student said, oh my gosh, that was an incredible conversation we had, Dr. Weizenbaum. And he was like, what are you talking about? Basically, he was talking to chatbot and thought it was Dr. Weizenbaum. Dr. Weizenbaum really spent the rest of his life asking questions about what happens if this is in the hands of more people. And he actually discovered that no matter who you are, no matter if you were super intelligent, if you were chatting to this system in the 60s and 70s, you would have a kind of delusional effect on yourself. In the same way that we personify our car, our favorite pair of scissors, when it's talking back to you, you as a human can't help but talk back to it and ascribe some kind of sense that it's a person. So that's since the 60s and 70s, and so no surprise it's happening right now. So when you put that issue and question aside, you realize that it can do many other types of things that are besides chatting with you. So these are two games, one game called Judgment Call, another called Who's Afraid of AI. One is from Microsoft. That's how I found my way to want to work at Microsoft one day on these AI questions. And also from Helen Armstrong, great book on AI for designers. And I was lucky to post online about this last week. And Sarah Gold, the guru of data and trust, pointed out two other games. One is called Cat's Wigs. Another is called AI Ideation. Check these games out. They're serious games to play because they're about what do you do when your product doesn't do what you want it to do in this new non-deterministic age of computation. Because of these foundation models, are more about probability, rolling the dice in smart ways, than like a robot following steps in this exact lockstep way that we're used to computers doing for us. So David Karem, the founder of Post Tool, if you're a 90s person, you know that David was way ahead of everyone else. He has a new tool out called Culture Club. It's a web app running, and it makes you think about how we can create things to simulate how they react to us. As we start to begin to close up the report, why don't you think of Ruskin and Morris, the people who got the arts and crafts movement going. They didn't start it, but they were the major uh, catalyst of it. 
And what's important to note is that in the age of textile machines that were basically better at weaving than the hand weaver of textiles, it was a big deal that led to the so-called Luddites movement. And Ruskin and Morris really railed against not the machine, but questions around what can we humans do that machines cannot do. And this is a rug from the V&A collection in the UK. And so it's important to look at this work because it's when humans tried to show that, hey, we humans, we're not bad at stuff. We're actually good at a lot of things. We humans will have to make things better than what machines can do. And that's exciting. So I was delighted to know that Masa Kawamura in Japan just produced this new film called Hidari. And this is a piece I edited of just some of the behind the scenes stuff. A really beautiful piece, all, all human made in a human way that is super hard to do in any other medium. So AI, look out. We humans were figuring stuff out. So remember the three kinds of design, classical design, design thinking, and computational design. When you think of design thinking, it's most likely set to be revolutionized because it's much easier to do design thinking with AI. You can use AI as a partner in doing your design thinking, and that's gonna be disruptive and actually quite useful to a lot of organizations trying to get out of their convergence and diverge just enough to help the customer a whole lot more. In classical design, it'll impact the way we imagine, make, create in the artistic design world as well. And so I'm looking forward to imagining how that changes curriculum in design programs around the world. It's a new medium, but it's a new tool for us to actually imagine, synthesize, generate, but also make critically. Critical making is a term I learned from my dear friend, Jesse Sheffrin, who was the former provost of Rhode Island School of Design, where I was lucky to lead. That was an awesome time of my life. I learned about the deep creative process that is part of every microdiscipline of creativity, whether it's printmaking, glass blowing, these different microdisciplines make with a kind of integrity that is all about the material, going back to material. So the materials are changing, tools are changing, exciting times. For folks who are afraid of AI, I like to break their thinking into two parts. One is there are things that you don't like to do that do not spark joy. Think of Marie Kondo, things that don't spark joy, throw them out of your house. So there are things you don't like to do, it's a good time to imagine what they are because you also want to imagine what you do like to do. What does spark joy? So it's important to imagine a world of AI where you, know, you can sick AI on stuff you don't like to do to make time to do what you love to do. And this harks back to my early book called The Laws of Simplicity, where I laid out the 10 laws of simplicity. And after I finished the book, I forgot to add one thing. You know, you make it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's the one thing that I should have like put in the book. And so it goes like this. It's called the cookie and laundry rule. If you offer your children or someone else's children two cookies, a large cookie and a small cookie, they're gonna choose the large cookie. If you offer them alternatively, two batches of work, like a large pile of laundry or a small pile of laundry, they are going to pick the smaller pile for some reason. So simplicity, I realized, is about there are things that you want to do more of and the things you want to do less of, and it's about living life with more enjoyment and less pain. It's a variant of the 10th law of simplicity. And so in conclusion, think of how to use AI to get rid of things you don't really want to do, the big pile of laundry, so you can spend more time on what you love to do. Bonus point here, if you're still scratching your head trying to understand it, there's two science fiction movies I recommend to understand this new foundation model, large language model AI moment. The first is Arrival. It's about talking with an alien, and it's about trying to find the right language to talk with the alien. That's kind of like prompting. The second one is Black Panther. There is a special metal called vibranium that has unusual properties. Think of that metal as something akin to the cognition blade of Simon Scissors. It's a brand new blade, it's amazing. So in summary, what I wanna leave you with is that design as a discipline is critical in this age of AI because on first glance, it doesn't seem to be about the prospects or customers, but it always is. Design is a discipline that was created to serve business. But it's also about people, uh, because people want something authentic. They appreciate you if you appreciate them. 
So design as a field is invaluable, especially in technology companies, and that's wavering a bit, I can see. But I think with AI, we're gonna see the need for it rise to a level that I don't think anyone could predict. Maybe me, <laughs> maybe, maybe you, maybe you're thinking that's possible. Uh, I think uh, it's gonna be really important because this new aesthetics of ethics is gonna be a question, not just a marketing blah, blah, blah about the importance of you know, good products that do good, because we need that. Everyone's becoming more intelligent about this. I believe that the switch will occur when we understand these important values-based questions around the future of AI and technology are both time and money saved things and new revenue achieve things. So next year's report will be about this, the business value of this new kind of design. And that's it. I want to thank my sponsor, The Earth, this illustration by Tony Ruth. Thanks for tuning in. The PDF is available on designintech.report. Have a great day. Thank you.